to host this. It's um, a terrific opportunity to talk poetry. Um, always something that I want to do. And I, I, my family has run out of patience with me talking about poetry. So I'm glad I can inflict it on you. <laughs> so I am, um, I'm a former English uh, teacher, a college English teacher. Um, and uh, I love poetry very much, um, but I know that not everyone does. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna frame this as a, um, a kind of teaser, a little taste of poetry, just to kind of get you interested in it. Um, the organization that I work for, Hoko Polizzo, um, was founded by um, someone many of you might know, Ellen Conroy Kennedy. Um, it was founded in 1974. And she was a visionary to found the organization. And then in 1986, she decided all of these wonderful events, um, I am, they're just, just, you know, they're in people's memories, but they're, they're in the ether. Um, so she began filming interviews with um, poets. And so that's where we've got these wonderful videos of these incredible poets that I decided um, uh, about 10 years ago to put on our YouTube page. So. There's 30 minutes of more than 100 poets and authors on our YouTube page. Um, but that's a that's full 30 minutes. You know, sometimes you just need a, a, a short hit of poetry in a, in a really quick period. Um, so when the pandemic struck last year, um, Hoko Polizzo wanted a way to reach people who were home and isolating and hungry for the kind of meaning and power that poetry can convey. Um, just a little, a moment of joy and connection. Um, and when George Floyd was killed last May, the project evolved and we decided to devote the first 11 poetry moment videos to poets of color. Um, we wanted to amplify the voices of black poets we've had over 46 years. Um, so that's where this project came from. And then Rohini was very gracious enough to say, um, well, let's get them out and, and, and put them together with a little, a little taste of poetry um, for everybody. So that's that's what we're gonna do today um, and every Tuesday this month. So if you have a great time, come back next Tuesday. Um, so what is poetry and, and how can you get over your reflexive anxiety about it? I don't know if anybody had this um, experience in high school where you had a teacher up in the front saying, what does this mean? Um, and it, it's very intimidating sometimes. And one of the things that so many of the poets that I know say is that poetry doesn't have to be answered like a riddle. It's something to be experienced like a movie or theater. Um, and you do that with your whole body. I mean, poetry comes out of breath. Um, one of my favorite books um, about reading poetry is is called How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry by Ed Hirsch. And he wrote that reading poetry is an adventure in renewal, a creative act, a perpetual beginning, a rebirth of wonder. Uh, I love that, um, that collection of phrases about what poetry is. Um, when I was teaching college, one of my um, analogies that was always a hit with college students was that if a novel is like a beer and a short story is like a glass of brandy, then a poem is like a shot, a shot of hard liquor. It is distilled, it's concentrated. Um, it's a, a really potent method of conveying in a short space, something very specific, but also incredibly vast. Um, I know that there are poems that I read in high school and college and I still remember them and I still go back to them. Um, they, um, the thing I wanna make sure we get across is that poems aren't, aren't puzzles that need to be solved. Um, the poet Paul Salon once said that poems were messages in bottles and not everyone's gonna discover them while they're walking on the beach. Um, and sometimes the waters erase some words. It's not always easy to read, but I think, I think they're worth picking up. And poetry is about, Rohini and I were just talking about this. Poetry is about paying attention, focusing for just a few moments on what's in front of you, um, allowing yourselves to unscroll that message from the bottle. Um, one last uh, quote, June Jordan, he's an amazing poet uh, who died way too young, said that poetry is a political act because it involves telling the truth. 
in the process of telling the truth about what you feel or what you see, each of us has to get in touch with himself or herself in a really deep, serious way. Our culture does not encourage us to undertake that attunement. So I'm asking today if we can slow down, to pay attention to language, to think from another person's point of view. Um, so think of poetry like yoga or meditation or prayer. It requires mindfulness. Um, all right. I'm going to jump right in um, and show or talk first about our topic, which is grief. It's something that everyone is dealing with this last year, and it's a huge topic. Um, but I feel like if poems talk very specifically about grief, it conveys something that feels universal. Everyone use, loses something or someone that they grieve over. Um, and you know, sympathy cards are wonderful, but they can't really explain um, grief. But sometimes poems offer a shared experience that might bring comfort or at least recognition. So the first poem we're going to listen to and watch is um, a, a short snippet from an interview with Linda Paston, who used to be the Maryland Poet Laureate. And she published her poem, Elegy, in 1986. Um, and it's, it's a very sad poem. And she makes a joke that people always ask her for poems about for funerals or weddings. And she says, I don't, I don't have many poems for, for weddings. <laughs> um, so she, she is concerned with grief. And in this poem, I'll set it up for you. Um, uh, the speaker of the poem is, is basically waiting for death. She's, she wrote this poem after the death of her mother. Um, and imagine the poet sitting by her mother's bedside in the hospital, watching the rise and fall of her mother's chest, um, waiting for the movement to stop and for death to arrive. So there's an extended image in this poem of movement up and down, uh, the everyday rhythms of you know sitting and standing, walking, lying deer. But here it's really embodied in the breath. And so you can hear the way things go up and down. Um, and so I'm going to attempt to play this poetry moment. So please, uh, you might want to also um, boost your volume a little bit so you can make sure that you, um, uh, you can hear us or you hear the, the poetry. And I'm gonna go ahead and we'll see if that works. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's Poetry Moment, featuring Linda Paston's poem, Elegy. I'm Sean Sebastian Knopf. Linda Paston is a quiet poet. Her poems don't shriek, they don't yell, but they still hit hard. In her senior year at Radcliffe, Paston won the Mademoiselle Magazine Poetry Prize. Sylvia Plath came in second. Over her 50 year career, Paston has written more than 15 books of poetry and essays, served as Maryland's Poet Laureate and won the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize. Her poem that follows this introduction is an elegy, a poem of lament for the dead. In the midst of a pandemic, everyone it seems now knows someone who has died of COVID-19. Every minute in the world, someone's mother, father, grandparent, friend, or child dies of this disease that we can't yet control. Paston's poem recalls a moment decades ago when her mother was in a hospital dying and Paston watched her struggle for life. The images in this poem focus on movement up and down. Snow falls. Flowers struggle up their stalks. The moon rises and sets. The speaker hoists herself from her bed and slides into sleep again. A mother's hospital gown propelled 
by raggedy breath lifts and falls with jagged respiration. The poem's sound is a rising and falling too with the breath of the reader. And the last line with newly shoveled earth settling is a finality. Even the sound of the word settling, sinking down into the belly when you say it, like a coffin lowered into a grave. Poetry Magazine wrote of those lines, here the minimal style heightens the speech of the faithful witness. Paston was a witness to death and wrote poems as an examiner of grief. In fact, in the full interview with her friend and fellow poet Lucille Clifton, Paston says that people often ask her for a poem to commemorate a funeral or a wedding. She says ruefully that she doesn't have many poems for weddings. Death in this poem and in our world today is both pedestrian and monumental. Most people who die of COVID-19 now, more than 2 million worldwide, end their lives with breath as ragged as Paston's mother's was, with chests pushing up and down by laboring lungs or by ventilators. Many say that being with a loved one at the time of death is a particular privilege. During these contagious times, loved ones can't be with those who are dying. Medical staff are the only witnesses and are suffering that burden. Take care, be safe, find some solace in poetry. And now, Elegy by Linda Paston. Elegy. Last night, the moon lifted itself on one wing over the fields, and struggling to rise this morning like a hooked fish through watery layers of sleep, I know with what difficulty flowers must pull themselves all the way up their stems. How much easier the free fall of snow or of leaves in their season. All week, watching the hospital gown rising and falling with your raggedy breath, I dreamed not of resurrections, but of the slow, sensual slide each night into sleep of dust or newly shoveled earth settling. <laughs> Okay, so sad. Um, the uh, can everybody everybody can hear me? Okay, Rohini, you can me thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, um, so the sound of the words in this poem um, and in every poem really matter. So if we read the poets poetry to ourselves in the head in our heads, even the sounds of the words matter because they, our brain is still processing it through our bodies. So when, um, when she says the word settling, that word even takes us time to say, it slows us down. It makes us think of dust settling at, you know, and then the hot connotation of us ashes to ashes. Um, so I think one of the things I wanted to convey with this poem, besides the, the message about grief is a, it's that it's about making connections between things that don't seem like they would normally make connections. The, the sound of the word settling and the, the way that the poet makes you feel like that's the very end and the end of the poem and the end of life. Um, so uh, I would love to hear what everybody else thought. Um, and we can, uh, you can, um, turn on your cameras or not. Um, but if you would like to, to comment on the poem, um, please just jump right in. Um, we, you can unmute yourself and we'll, uh, we'll hear from you. And if you don't, I'll keep talking. <laughs> okay, all right. 
I don't see anybody, then I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next one. A little lighter. Our next poem um, is by Stanley Kunitz, who's one of my favorites. He wrote poetry for more than 70 years. Um, he lived a very good long life. And the poem that we're going to talk about next is called The Long Boat. Um, and that is, um, it, the ta it takes place right after a death. So there's an extended metaphor that he uses in this poem um, of the long sea voyage that is life and then um, being pushed out to sea on a Viking boat at the end of that life. So the poem speaker we discover as we listen along is a dead man. So the speaker is a dead man and his mourners are gathered on the shore to bid farewell to him. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of Norse mythology connection here. Um, Vikings used to bury their dead on, on ships and either send them out to sea or even take the boat onto the shore and bury the boat. Um, there's a new, um, there's a new movie called The Dig about Norse, um, Norse grave sites that were boats. Um, so what we're discovering as we're going through the poem is just what the speaker is discovering. Oh my gosh, I'm dead. What do I do now? Um, and the mourners on the shore gradually fade away. And there, there comes a moment, um, and you'll know when it is, um, when the speaker just lets go. And it's, it's, a, it's actually a, a beautiful moment. So I'm going to go ahead and um, play that one. Hoko Palitzo's Poetry Moment, featuring Stanley Kunitz's poem, The Long Boat. I'm Sarah Luckadoo. Stanley Kunitz had a long time to contemplate mortality. The poet wrote and read and worked in his garden until he was a hundred years old. And he often talked about the idea that while we're in the midst of being alive, we're also on the path to our graves. Kunitz wrote, the deepest thing I know is that I am living and dying at once, and my conviction is to report that self-dialogue. The video that follows this introduction captures Kunitz at age 88 reading The Long Boat. This poem centers on the Viking funeral ritual of putting their dead on boats and setting them adrift. Kunitz visited Hoko Palitzo audiences during the term of his second National Poet Laureate appointment and recorded an interview and a reading of this poem. In Norse mythology, boats represented the Vikings' life at sea, so the dead were sometimes placed on ships and sent out to sea or buried in grave mounds shaped like ships outlined in stones. In 1904, just a year before poet Stanley Kunitz was born, this Viking burial ship was discovered in a burial mound with two female skeletons and ritual funeral goods on board. It dates from before the year 800. The poem, The Longboat, hovers on the perimeter between life and death, touching on what is precious about life and also what is inevitable, even peaceful, about death. Kunitz begins his poem with the boat leaving the shore, bearing a dead passenger who is, on the, who is the poem's speaker. Kunitz allows readers to feel the dead man's nostalgia and reluctance on leaving the world of the living, but also the contentment of slipping into death. The Viking's burial ship is also his cradle, rocked by the waves into the peace of the infinite, with a nod to Walt Whitman's poem out of the cradle, endlessly rocking. Kunitz, who won the Pulitzer at age 54 and a National Book Award for work published when he was 90, said he believed the secrets to his longevity were writing poetry, being curious, digging in his garden, and drinking martinis. 
but it's through his writing that readers understand the deep beliefs he held about the importance of poetry and the sacred nature of life. In his preface to his collection, through later poems, new and selected, Kunitz wrote, the poem comes in the form of a blessing, like rapture breaking on the mind, as I tried to phrase it in my youth. Through the years, I have found this gift of poetry to be life-sustaining, life-enhancing, and absolutely unpredictable. Does one live, therefore, for the sake of poetry? No, the reverse is true. Poetry is for the sake of the life. And now, The Longboat by Stanley Kunitz. The Longboat. When his boat snapped loose from its moorings under the screeching of the gulls, he tried at first to wave to his dear ones on shore, but in the rolling fog, they had already lost their faces. Too tired even to choose between jumping and calling, somehow he felt absolved and free of his burdens. Those mottos stamped on his name tag, conscience, ambition, and all that caring. He was content to lie down with the family ghosts in the slop of his cradle, buffeted by the storm, endlessly drifting. Peace, peace, to be rocked by the infinite, as if it didn't matter which way was home, as if he didn't know he loved the earth so much he wanted to stay forever. So um, we, uh, we hear the speaker gradually let go of everything. You know, he's letting go of all that caring, of all the faces that he loved. Um, and he becomes content. And then we hear the, the repetition of the word peace. So when a poet repeats a word in the short space that he or she has to get that across their points, you know that word's important. And when, he, when Stanley says peace, um, it's one of the most soothing and longest one syllable words, you know, other one syllable words, cat or wing or jab are, are short, but peace, it just makes you breathe longer. Um, and that's, I think, the moment when the, the dead man lets go and says, ah, I can just float. I don't have to have a destination. And he's rocked by the infinite. It's just one of the most comforting poems <laughs> to me. Um, one of his famous speeches, Kunitz said, poetry is intimately concerned with the historic process. It tells us what it feels like to be alive in a given time and place. Words themselves forever tuned to the passing show, forever tied to their own roots, and yet forever changing are the most sensitive recording instruments. I, I, I thought that was a great, um, thing because sometimes the way a poem works is that it captures something just holds it like a, a bug in amber um, and I, I, I feel like that's a, a, a sensitive recording instrument. Um, would anyone like to say anything about this poem? Yes. Uh, hi Eileen. Um, I would just like to say that your mention of the movie The Dig yeah. was very appropriate. It was a beautiful film. And you're talking about the way that Kunitz um, used the words peace and comforting. We're so spot on in the movie when the character actually lies down in the boat that it's not grief, but it's relief. It was, it was a lovely movie and I recommend it along with this poem. Great. I agree that scene where she lies down in the grave with her son and the uh, it, and she knows she's dying. It's just you're right. Yes. It's a moment of 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 contented release. Yeah, very much like this poem. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, and you can feel free to turn off the the transcript if you find it disturbing. Uh, 
from the bottom of your screen, it might say CC or whatever, and you can turn it off. Very good. Okay. So our next one, um, we're going to end with a little, little bit of humor, a lighter, a lighter moment. Um, there is grief, absolutely, but there's also a little bit of humor. Um, this last poem is by a poet named Taylor Molly. Um, and the poem is called My Deepest Condiments. Um, and yes, you heard that right. Condiments like ketchup and mayonnaise. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a found poem, which means that something kind of falls into the poet's lap. It's a gift of language that jump starts their poem. Um, I think of Hemingway's, um, I think it was Hemingway, who the, um, the saddest poem was for sale, baby shoes never worn. Um, that's a kind of found poem, um, something that drops in your lap and you turn it into a poem. So this poem, um, it, it has rhymes in it, things that we wouldn't normally think of as rhyming, um, sentiments and condiments. Um, and the rhyme makes you tie together things that wouldn't normally be tied together, such as grief and humor. Um, so I'm going to play this one and then we can talk about it. Nope, that's the wrong. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's Poetry Moment, featuring My Deepest Condiments by Taylor Molly. I'm Shania Hudson. There are five accepted stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Poet Taylor Molly adds a sixth, humor. Sure, Shakespeare wrote, to weep is to make less the depth of grief. But what about laughter? Molly proposes with his poem, My Deepest Condiments, that humor can help one endure grief. A four-time National Poetry Slam champion, Molly studied at Oxford with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Molly taught high school English for almost 10 years, then hit it big with his poem, What Teachers Make. The New York Times has called him a ranting comic showman and literary provocateur. In his Writing Life interview, Molly talked about the Latin poet Horace and his declaration in the year 19 BC that the task of the poet was to instruct or to delight. The greatest praise, Horace said, should be reserved for those who can do both. Molly explains, I try to delight and I try to instruct. If I can't do both of those, let me be merely delightful. The truth is that people are going to listen to the beauty of your words and your words will find a deeper place and stay there if people can enjoy them on the way down. His poem, My Deepest Condiments, lingers on the small reprieves and grief that can sometimes arise. Molly wrote the poem based on experiences just after his father died. A friend's letter of condolence arrived at Molly's home, sending her deepest condiments. No one knows what to write in a sympathy card, but deepest condiments is probably not the best choice. The dead, Molly writes in his verse, don't need ketchup and mustard in the afterlife. Molly's language in the poem, such as when he rhymes condiments with sentiments is playful but his subject is serious. To Molly, riffing on the found poem of his friend's mistaken choice of words, the gesture was sweet relief. Laughter is the best medicine, so the saying goes, and this poem brings the funny, but in a bittersweet way. Because by the end, after the laughter, Molly returns to cry just a bit more. And now, My Deepest Condiments by Taylor Molly.
I send you my deepest condiments was in no way what my old friend meant to say or write or send the night she penned a note to me one week after my father died. Not condolences or sentiments. No, she sent me her deepest condiments instead, as though the dead have need of ketchup, mustard, or relish on the other side. And oh, that word made me laugh so hard out loud it hurt, so beautifully absurd. And such a sweet relief during a time when it seemed that only grief was allowed in after my father's death. Sweet and simple laughter, which is nothing more than breath, brought up from so far deep inside so many years, it often brings up with it tears. And so I laughed and I laughed until my sides were sore. And later, I think I may have even cried a little more. So he, um, he's reciting that poem uh, and it's, it's a light, you know, it's clearly light. He, he's a poetry slam um, champion. So he, he knows how to deliver and he studied with the Shakespeare company. Um, so he knows how to deliver that poem and you can hear the rhyme in it, but it's very subtle, you know, breath and death and years and tears. Um, the, it's a light tone, but it's also, it's also weighty, especially at the end. Um, the laughter that comes up, I don't know if anyone has had this happen, but sometimes in the midst of something horrible um, and, and grievous, you have this, whole, this impulse to laugh and it, it brings up even more grief. And so you, you have this mixture of, of grief and laughter that is just so bittersweet. Um, and I thought, uh, I thought it was a, an interesting way of pulling all of that together. Um, all right, so anyone have any, uh, anything to say about that one? Hi, Kathy. Hi, um, now that we know that that was actually the poem and not him talking about it, could you possibly play play his bit again? Oh, so sure, we can sure, listen sure. as sure. though it's the poem? Yes, absolutely. I will absolutely do that. No, you're right, because he's not reading it, you don't realize until yeah. about halfway through. Okay, I should have I should have warned you. Let me let me try that again. All right, you ready? Here we go. Good point. Let me just, just do, just him. Let me just do him. By Taylor Molly. I send you my deepest condiments was in no way what my old friend meant to say or write or send the night she penned a note to me one week after my father died. Not condolences or sentiments. No, she sent me her deepest condiments instead as though the dead have need of ketchup, mustard, or relish on the other side. And oh, that word made me laugh so hard out loud it hurt, so beautifully absurd. And such a sweet relief during a time when it seemed that only grief was allowed in after my father's death. Sweet and simple laughter, which is nothing more than breath brought up from so far deep inside so many years, it often brings up with it tears. And so I laughed and I laughed until my sides were sore. And later, I think I may have even cried a little more. Very good point, Kathy. Thank you. I, I should Thanks. have uh, let folks know that he was going to be reciting this um, because it does flow, right? You can, you can just hear it flowing from him very conversationally but you can also hear the rhymes in there that tie together things, grief and relief and absurd and hurt that, that normally don't go together. So I, I thank you for, for ask, asking for that again, Kathy. It was a great idea. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. It's not easy to write about, uh, you know, what you talked about uh, when you laugh and you cry or you, you're laughing and you start crying and that mix of emotions. It's very difficult to write about that. So he kind of did a really great job of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he has a great poem um, called What Teachers Make. And um, if, you, if you Google him on YouTube, you can, you can find out it's a, it's a terrific poem uh, about the value of education and, and educators. Um, so I, uh, I commend that to you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Eileen, I see your hand up. Um, it was interesting to me in the middle of the, his poem that he said he laughed so hard it hurt. And, you know, we talk about emotions being on the, the same spectrum, but at opposite ends. And he cries and he laughs and it hurts and he's happy. And I think he expresses that continuum very well in his poem. It's very true because all emotion, whether it's good or bad or sad or happy, is a release, a relief in a way. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah, we tend to, you're absolutely right, I mean, it, we tend to think of them as, as polar opposites, but they're all occurring in our body at the same time, <laughs> you know, um, I, I agree, yeah. Um, Diane says she liked this poem the best out of the three. Thanks, Diane. It is a fun one. He's, he's a fun, he's a fun writer. Um, he also, um, he does a bunch of audiobooks if you're interested in just his voice. He reads audiobooks as well. <laughs> So you can, you can find that in the library. Um, I'm looking back at something Anne said about the first poem, Elegy, um, and she's absolutely right. She says that the, the struggle up, as in for flowers, is so much harder than the release down, like snow or leaves. Um, that's a really good, um, that's a really good observation. And, and down is the final down, you know, maybe it, that settling is the most ease, as in when um, Stanley Kunitz's speaker says peace. You feel like there's just something that releases in you, very much like the laughter and the tears in, in Taylor Molly's poem, this, this release. And I think poetry can, can do that. Um, it is kind of cathartic and it gives you a release. Um, so I'm, I, I appreciate that comment, Anne. Thank you. Uh, we, we're going to be having uh, other poetry moments every Tuesday. So if you haven't registered, I will be sending out the links after this. And uh, Susan has also compiled a great list of books if you want to you know, get more into poetry. I think I found that statement you know, about um, for sale baby shoes never worn. I mean, it's just a simple statement, but it hits you so hard. Right, right. I think, you know. Right, I mean, the, that's the thing about poetry. It can be tiny, but it expands out um, as you add your own experience. You know, I'm sure that when I was a kid and I read that, I may not have had as much of a reaction now that I have my own children. Um, so you're right, it, it tends to explode in meeting um, as, you, as you go along. Um, and Anne says, um, Anne says she thought um, the second poem connected to the first one and the third, she liked the third one too, um, connected to the breath. That's absolutely true. We tend to, you know, think of poets as reading on the page, but poetry from the very beginning, you know, collected around the fire was spoken or sung. And so it's very intimately connected with the breath and the body, you know. This, the length of a line is about the length of a breath in most poetry. Um, yeah. Um, all right, and Gerald says, um, it was interesting listening and not knowing when it would end. That's a very good point. When you listen to poetry, if you're reading it, you know that that's the last line. But when you're listening, you can't really tell. Sometimes you can. I think when you get to the end of um, Linda Passon's poems, and, and everything is settling. You know that's the last word. Um, but it's great. And she's, Gerald says it makes you want to hear it again. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm very happy. 
Um, I'm going to put in the um, chat, there's a, um, the Columbia Festival of the Arts has a collection of these poetry moments on their site, uh, on their new arts channel. So I'll make sure and put that in the chat. Um, it's, uh, and it's got a lot of these that we might be using. Not all of them are up there yet because they're just launching this. Um, uh, so I'll make sure and put that link in the chat. Um, next week, our theme, we're doing themes of poetry. Next week, our theme is history. So we'll be looking at, um, at lots of different moments in history um, and how poets deal with those. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, if you send me the link, uh, Susan, I'll put, put that out in the follow up email too. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And so send that everybody has email. all the information they need in the follow up email. And I hope to see everyone join in again. This was wonderful. Uh, absolutely wonderful. And maybe we can kind of play the, 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 po the poem twice next time around. Sure. Uh, we can figure that out. And uh, we welcome your comments and feedbacks. Both Susan and I would love to hear from you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to unmute yourself and say anything that you would like to. Yes, please. Uh, love to hear from everybody. Thank you. And this was great. A nice, a nice little quick break in your day. <laughs> Make, makes you think about things. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Anyone that will think about poetry will, will make me happy. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll stick around if anyone has any particular questions, but um, happy to have you all here. And I was very grateful that you, you came and spent some time with me in poetry and Rohini. Thank you to the library very much. Thank you. Um, Edis is asking for um, a list of poems and authors. I will absolutely send that to Rohini so she can, uh, she can send it out. Okay, yeah, sure, we can uh, do that. And um, yeah, we also have that other list that we talked about, but yeah, we can send out the list of the poems and authors. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, thank you, Edith. It's a great idea. And I hope I pronounced your name right. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> I think um, there are a couple of things we can probably work out. Okay. And the pronunciation of her name is correct, Edith. Edith oh, okay, great. Great. So now it's the two of us. Great. 